Thank you for joining. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon. I'm Maria Guy, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health updates call for today, June 7th, 2023. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov forward slash One Health forward slash Zohu slash 2023 slash June dot HTML. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health identify a One Health strategy for prevention of public health threats, identify a One Health approach or strategy for detection of public health threats, identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats, or list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health team. Next slide, please. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide, please. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash One Health slash Sohu slash continuing education. And the course access code is Zohu Webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by July 10th, 2023. A captioned video of today's webinar will also be posted at https colon slash slash www.cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2023 slash june dot html. And that'll happen within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by July 11th, 2025. Next slide, please. So before we begin today's presentations, I will go ahead and share some news and updates. So we'd appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link, cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu, with your colleagues from the public health, agriculture, wildlife, plant, environment, and other relevant sectors, and let them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education that the Zohu Call offers. Before our presentations begin, I'll take a moment to share some updates and resources. As always, you can find links to these resources in today's Zohu Call email newsletter. If you aren't yet subscribed to that newsletter, please sign up by using the link at the top of the main Zohu Call webpage. Next slide, please. 
So today's newsletter highlights several publications, including of note, characterizing the One Health workforce to promote interdisciplinary multi-sectoral approaches in global health problem solving. Um, a couple sal salmonella publications, including Epidemiology of Salmonellosis Among Infants in the United States, 1968 to 2015, and Salmonella Outbreaks um, Associated with Not Ready to Eat Breaded Stuffed Chicken Products, United States, 1998 to 2022. Next slide, please. And we've also highlighted some um, MMWRs, including Epidemiologic Trends of Dengue in U.S. Territories, 2010 to 2020, Unprecedented Outbreak of West Nile Virus, Maricopa County, Arizona in 2021. Um, and notes from the field, Bibliosis cases associated with floodwaters during and after Hurricane Ian in Florida, September to October 2022. And on this slide, you can also find web resources and announcements, including links to CDC's Healthy Swimming website and the recently updated and newly published 2024 CDC Yellow Book. Next slide, please. Additional highlights include a One Health Trust podcast, The Case of the Killer Eye Drops, and a blog piece titled A Superbug Stalked My Daughter and Stole Her Life. Phage therapy could have saved her. Next slide, please. And here are some events and observances that may be of interest for this month. So June is National Pet Preparedness Month, so please do make sure to include your pets in your preparedness plans. June 7th is World Food Safety Day. And there's also two conferences that we wanted to note. CSTE's annual conference, which takes place June 25th to 29th, and AVMA's 2023 convention, which takes place July 14th to 18th. Next slide, please. Finally, we've shared some ongoing outbreak investigations, including three separate salmonella outbreaks linked to cookie dough, flour, and backyard poultry. The hepatitis A virus outbreak linked to frozen organic strawberries, and two listeria outbreaks, one linked to enoki mushrooms and the second where the food source is still currently unknown. Next slide, please. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases and to find details and ongoing about ongoing US outbreaks on the CDC websites linked from today's newsletter. Our next SOHU call will occur on August 2nd, 2023. So please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news to your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. Next slide, please. And then for question and answers before we begin, you may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please be sure to include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will focus on after the final presentation, if time permits. You may also email questions to today's presenters, and we've included their email addresses on this slide. They'll also be on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's Zohu email newsletter. Next slide, please. So without further ado, um, our first presentation will, will be from Megan Swanson on trends in reported babesiosis cases, 2011 to 2019 in the US. So Megan, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. So first a bit of background. Babesiosis is a, is a disease caused by an intraerythrocytic protozoa, which is a parasite, is most commonly transmitted by a tick bite. There are over 100 Babesia species that infect mammals, and several can cause illness in people, with Babesia microti being the most common species in the United States. Illness onsets typically one to four weeks after a tick bite, and the disease can also be transmitted by blood transfusion and also mother to child. Clinical characteristics of the disease include fever, headache, chills, aches and pains, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. 
Babesiosis can also cause severe illness and death in people with compromised immune systems, people who don't have a spleen, the elderly, and those who are infected by a blood transfusion, but treatment is available. Next slide. So the most common way that babesiosis is transmitted is through tick bites. The natural host of the disease is a white-footed mouse, uh, and the black-legged or deer tick transmit the, transmits the disease. So these are the same ticks that spread Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, as well as anaplasmosis. Some behaviors that are associated with the tick bite transmission of babesiosis are hiking, yard work, and camping, really anything that puts a person into contact with a place a tick might live. For, tick, uh, for transfusion transmission, there is screening in place for the blood supply for certain states, and this is determined by the Food and Drug Administration. And there are uh, just a small number of cases reported each year. Next slide. Uh, so the disease itself has been notifiable to CDC since 2011. Uh, and you can see on the right, the states that aren't in gray are states that do report to CDC. So that's 40 states and one city, New York City. The disease itself is regional with most cases occurring in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, and that's about 95% of all cases reported each year. Cases can also be travel associated uh, if a person goes to an endemic area or an area where babesiosis uh, is, and then goes they go back home and then develop the illness. Uh, and cases have been documented in parts of Canada. Next slide, please. So to be counted as a surveillance case of babesiosis, a person needs to meet the case definition, and this can be either a confirmed or a probable case of babesiosis. For both of these definitions, uh, it includes both a diagnostic test, either looking for evidence of the parasite itself or antibodies to the parasite, babesia, as well as uh, symptoms that are associated with babesiosis. Next slide. So now I'm going to go through our trend analysis. Next, please. So the objective of this analysis was to describe and assess trends in reported cases of babesiosis in the United States. To do this, we used case report form data that was submitted to the CDC's parasitic diseases branch by jurisdictions across the country, as well as national notifiable disease surveillance system data that was submitted to CDC C cells by those same jurisdictions. To make our analysis data set, we combined data reported from 2011 through 2019 and included states that submitted data in each of these years and had 10 or more cases for two, at least two or more consecutive years. For the analysis, we conducted descriptive statistics as well as a Poisson regression to assess sig significance in changes in incidence over time, rates of incidence over time in these states. Next, please. So this slide shows the total number of cases reported in the country from 2011 to 2019. So there is a total of uh, just a bit over 16,000 cases reported in this total time period with uh, around 1,000 being reported in 2011, increasing up to almost 2,500 cases in 2019. Next slide, please. So looking at this geographically, um, here we can see a map of the United States with the average number of cases reported each year by state. So as I mentioned earlier, the disease itself is geographically distributed, and you can see that the majority the, of cases are reported out of the Northeast, with the highest number of average cases being in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. Next, please. We look at this by case rate of uh, over 100,000 people. We can see similar dis distributions in the Northeast and Midwest with the highest uh, average reported case rate being in the state of Rhode Island, uh, followed by Massachusetts and Connecticut. Next, please. So when we look at the case rates or incidents over time by state, we can see differences uh, by the state, uh, by states, uh, but a general increasing trend for all of these states with Rhode Island in that dark blue at the top um, having the highest case uh, rate or incidence each year. Um, and I want to um, just click next, please. Yeah, I want to point out uh, here in orange, uh, ending at the second highest line is Maine. So Maine started off, if you follow that trend down, near the lower end of yearly incidence and has now increased by 2019 to being the second highest uh, incidence rate per year. 
uh, and then click again, please, twice, uh, make it easier, yep. Yeah. Uh, and then I also want to point out the states of Vermont and New Hampshire, who also started out low. So you can see all these three lines at the bottom in 2011 and um, now increasing uh, to uh, by 2019. Next slide, please. So moving on to the results of our Poisson regression analysis, uh, in this table shows is that we determined that the increases in case rates were statistically significant in eight out of 10 states. Um, you can see from the p-value in the far right. So those states are Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. So the only states that didn't have significant increases or changes in case rates or incidents over time are Minnesota and Wisconsin. In the, so those are the Midwestern states. Uh, I also want to point out that the largest percent changes in rates from 2011 to 2019 in the second column from the end occurred in Vermont, which increased 1600 percent from 2011 to 2019, uh, followed by Maine increasing 1400, about 1400 percent in that time period, and then New Hampshire increasing about 370 percent from 2011 to 2019. Um, I also want to point out that the case counts do vary greatly by state and, of course, by year. So the lowest number of cases reported in a year were by Vermont, with two cases reported in 2011, and the largest in New York State, uh, 696 cases reported in 2017. Um, next slide, please. So the takeaway from this analysis is that incidence of reported babesiosis is increasing in eight out of 10 states included in the analysis. And this could possibly be related to changes in land use patterns where people and ticks are in close contact. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont will now be considered to be endemic states for babesiosis by CDC. That people living in and traveling to endemic states and states with babesiosis transmission should be aware and take steps to prevent tick bites and that clinicians should also consider babesiosis as a diagnosis if a person has uh, 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 symptoms that relate to the disease or risk. Next slide, please. Uh, so speaking about prevention, the best way to prevent babesiosis is to do tick bite prevention. So that includes wearing long sleeves and pants, using insect repellents like those containing permethrin before going outside into an area that could have ticks, using tick bite prevention on pets. And I wanna note here that Babesia species can infect dogs, but those species don't cause illness in humans. Um, also to avoid areas with ticks like wooded and brushy areas, and that can be in yards, parks, or other areas. And when you come back inside after being out to check for ticks uh, on, your, on your body. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's the end of the presentation. And I just wanna thank my co-authors, Amy, John, and Sue, as well as CDC staff who supported this work and worked on this work, um, Elizabeth and CSEL staff, as well as state and local public health staff who contributed to this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. We really appreciate your work as well. We'll move on now to our next presenter, and that is Michelle Halafza. Um, she will be presenting on animals and pools. So Michelle, it's all yours when you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Next slide, please. So these CDC Healthy Swimming recommendations are the result of inquiries coming in from the public. Um, and generally, this would be backyard pool owners or, or um, home spa owners. And uh, they were developed um, as part of with a One Health approach. Um, we used our swimming expertise here at Healthy Swimming, and then we we checked in with our veterinary colleagues across CDC to make sure we got our recommendations right. Next slide, please. So the most common um, inquiry that we have coming in in terms of animals is someone finding a dead animal in their backyard pool. Um, those were most when we before we posted the recommendations, uh, the reports that we got or the inquiries that we got were about dead skunks, birds, mice, gophers, rats, snakes, frogs, bats, and raccoons. And I'm going to focus on the fir first part of that list and get to raccoons later on. So most of these animals, so excluding raccoons, if they're found in the pool, they tend not to uh, pose a health risk to swimmers. Most of the pathogens that colonize or infect these animals 
animals don't infect humans, but a few of the pathogens that do infect these animals can infect humans. Most pathogens carried by these animals aren't activated by free chlorine within minutes at concentrations that CDC recommends. So that's one to 10 um, parts per million or PPM, also known as milligrams per liter, or the concentrations that are typically required by the local, state, territorial, or tribal code. In terms of dealing with um, finding a dead animal in the pool, um, we have a few simple steps. Next slide, please. So the first step um, to keeping swimmers safe is to close the pool to swimmers. Then uh, we tell the uh, backyard pool owner or hot tub owner to put on disposable gloves and use a net or a bucket to remove the dead animal from the pool safely. Um, we tell the owner to then uh, double bag the animal in plastic garbage bags, clean off any debris from the item used to remove the dead animal from the water, um, just make sure there's no no hair or anything left on the item that was used, um, for example, um, and then taking the gloves off, placing them in the garbage bag, closing the garbage bag, and putting um, those garbage bags in a sealed trash can. We want to make sure other animals don't get at that dead animal. And of course, being that I'm in the water sanitation and hygiene team, I'm going to tell you to wash your hands really well after doing this. Um, then we want to raise the chlorine to two parts per million or ppm uh, or maintain it there if it already is there and during the 30 minutes that we're going to keep the pool water at two parts per million free chlorine we want to make sure that the pH is less than um, 7.5 or 7.5 or less and that the temperature is greater than or equal to um, 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. So it's going to be that temperature or higher. So I've been really emphasizing free chlorine, and the free chlorine is being emphasized here because it is the most active disinfectant form of chlorine. So when we add chlorine products, we're generating different types of chlorine, and the free chlorine is going to be the form of the chlorine that's most effective at inactivating or killing pathogens. Now, the key to making sure that our chlorine, um, that we're generating free chlorine when we're adding, is the pH. And typically you'll see in pool codes a pH of 7.0 or 7.2 to 7.8 being required. And that's to balance the needs of the pool equipment, the swimmers, as well as um, making sure we're inactivating pathogens. The lower the pH, the more we're we're going to generate that free chlorine concentration. The only problem is, is the lower that we go with the pH, the more likely we are to corrode equipment, the more likely we irritate the skin and the, um, the eyes of the swimmer. And if we go too low, we start losing fine body hair or swimmers start losing fine body hair in the water and they can even lose dental enamel. So we definitely want to make sure we don't go too low with the pH. And to, uh, as far as temperature is concerned, um, Previous slide, oh, this, this slide, good, thank you. Um, as far as temperature is concerned, that's just simple chemistry 101. The higher the temperature, the higher the rate of chemical reactions, the faster the disinfection occurs. So we're gonna be maintaining these parameters for 30 minutes. We're gonna immerse the item that we cleaned the pool with, that we removed the animal and then we with, and then we cleaned. We're gonna immerse that in the pool, and again, for the 30 minutes. And then while this is all going on, we're going to make sure that the filtration system is working. This is important because if there's hair in the pool, if there's leaves in the pool, if there's something just floating in that water, we want to get that out of the water so that the chlorine is um, working on inactivating pathogens and, and not getting at debris at the pool in the pool. Next slide. So um, I, I mentioned previously that raccoons are a bit of an issue on their own, and that's because they can be infected uh, with Bellis ascaris. Uh, raccoon feces can contain Bellis ascaris eggs and worms, and in this photo is a picture um, of, an, of a Bellis ascaris egg. And if a swimmer were to ingest these eggs, or enough of these eggs, that could lead to infection of the brain or spinal cord, which is called neural, um, neural larva migraines. It could lead to infection of the eyes, ocular larva migraines, or of the other organs, visceral larva migraines. Uh, less than 25 infections have been uh, documented in humans in the U.S., so this is a rare infection but it has consequences. So um, 
raccoons have been documented to be infected with Bellisaskars throughout the U.S., most notably in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the Midwest, and the West Coast. And when a raccoon becomes infected uh, with Bellisaskars, the worms mature in the um, raccoon's intestine, and then the raccoon will um, pass millions of eggs through their feces. The eggs have to sit in the environment for two to four weeks before they become infectious. And so it's going to be really important to get, you know, whether that's a dead raccoon in the pool or it's feces in the pool, it's really important to get those out as soon as possible before the eggs become infectious. Because these eggs are going to be really resistant to environmental um, conditions. Um, and if they're in moist conditions, like in a pool, they can survive for years. The recommended chlorine levels that we have in our pools, what CDC recommends, what our state, local, territorial, and tribal partners um, typically require, are not going to be enough to kill these eggs and make them non-infectious. Uh, there have been studies that show you drop these eggs into straight bleach and they can still come out um, infectious. When you read about remediating surfaces that have come in contact with these, with raccoon feces, uh, they, it talks about using a propane torch or um, boiling water. So these are pretty tough eggs. Next slide, please. So when it comes to finding a dead raccoon in the pool or raccoon feces in, in the water, there are two options. The eggs are pretty, uh, relatively speaking, are pretty big. So you could close the pool to swimmers and then filter the pool for 24 hours or more and then backwash or clean the filter. So you're going to run the water in the opposite direction to clean it. At that point, if you have the, um, certain filter media in the pool, so if you have a sand filter, which is typically what we see for backyard pools, or a diatomaceous earth, commonly known as DE um, filter, then you can um, take that filter out and uh, filter media out and replace it with fresh media. The old media, the one that's being discarded, you want to put in plastic garbage bags, double bag and remove your gloves, put that away in the garbage bag. And again, I'm gonna tell you to wash your hands. Um, the other option, if you have a smaller body of water, a smaller pool or a hot tub, you might wanna consider just backwashing that filter again, uh, cleaning out that filter by reversing the water flow and then draining that body of water um, and hosing down the surfaces of that pool or hot tub, the smaller pool or hot tub. Again, you can replace the filter media in certain cases, and then you're going to refilter, um, refill the pool, excuse me. Next slide, please. So this is a lot of work to do with a pool, closing it down for 24 hours and filtering it or potentially draining it, uh, cleaning it, and then, and then refilling it. So it's really important to keep raccoons out of the water to begin with. So um, you can... Um, we know that raccoons tend to defecate in the same place repeatedly. They have their latrines. In pools, this will usually be in shallow water, so the top step of the pool. So our tips um, for keeping raccoons in the pool are just where you would do it, how you would do it anywhere else. You want to keep a fence around the pool, and you want to keep that fence closed. That fence is probably going to be required to be there to prevent uh, young children from drowning, but it can also potentially help keep raccoons away. You want to prevent access to food, not feeding the raccoons, leaving pet food outside, securing trash cans properly, removing bird feeders. You also, at least near the pool, want to clear the brush. You want to make sure that the raccoon doesn't build a den uh, nearby. Um, and you can just cover the area that the raccoon, that the raccoon keeps um, visiting. It might come to the point where you're going to have to contact animal control or pest control to remove and relocate uh, the raccoon or raccoons. Next slide, please. The other issue we hear about a lot is birds and pools. So a lot of birds, the ducks and the geese, they're going to be attracted to the water in the pool. And if they're going to be spending time in the water in the pool, they're probably going to deposit um, their feces or their droppings in the water. So they're potentially going to expose swimmers. Uh, duck and geese droppings or feces um, contain E. coli or can contain E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, or cryptosporidium even. 
and these can infect um, humans. Most of these pathogens, with the exception of cryptosporidium, are going to be readily uh, killed or inactivated within minutes uh, by the free chlorine in the water that we talked about earlier, that one to 10 parts uh, per million. And these are, again, what CDC recommends and what typically is going to be required by our local, state, territorial, and tribal um, codes. Cryptosporidium, on the other hand, um, is pretty resistant or tolerant to chlorine. And so um, there is one species that doesn't commonly infect humans. It can infect humans, but doesn't commonly do so. That could potentially be transmitted. And that's a footnote we have in um, uh, in the recommendations if, if, the, if cryptosporidium is an issue in the area to address that specifically. Next slide, please. So again, um, what we're going to do here is pretty much follow what we would do and take the same steps that we would for a dead animal, except in this case, instead of removing a dead animal, we're removing the bird feces and then we're gonna disinfect um, the water. Next slide, please. But again, this is a lot of work. So what's the better way to, how's the, what's the better way to approach this? It's about keeping the birds away from the pool to begin with. So um, if there are um, plants in the area that the ducks are gonna like to eat the nuts, fruits or berries of, we're gonna wanna remove those or move them somewhere else. Um, we are gonna want to remove any bird feeders by the pool. And um, we're going to try to limit the branches hanging around or over the pool. So we're going to trim or remove trees and shrubs. Um, we've also um, recommend uh, reducing grass lawns around pools. Ducks, geese love grass. So if we can either reduce the grass or put a barrier between the grass and the pool, that will also um, help prevent the birds from getting into the water. Uh, Again, sometimes it takes the situation gets to the point where you're going to have to remove the dom domestic ducks or geese from the pool area. You just you can't get them away. That's going to potentially be a little bit more complicated than you know when than when we were talking about raccoons. Um, ducks and geese are protected by the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, so the legal options about dealing with these birds is going to be somewhat limited and might require a permit. Uh, so if this is the this, this is the approach that needs to be taken, we recommend consulting the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the uh, state wildlife agency. Next slide, please. So these recommendations that I've gone over, they generally um, were put together keeping a residential or backyard pool hot tub in mind. And so what happens in most state, local, territorial, tribal jurisdictions is aside from having fencing around the pool, there are, is no regulation of the pool. So, you know, there are no, there is no one monitoring the pool and making sure there's compliance generally. Um, so basically what it comes down to is just CDC recommendations. When it comes to pools that are open to the public or hot tubs that are open to the public or splash pads where that water shooting out of the concrete, those kind of fountains, um, when it comes to those, you know, lots of state codes, uh, local codes, tribal and territorial codes do address those. So if there's multiple families going into that, it's not just the local town pool. We're also talking about the water park pools, the pools uh, at the hotel or the apartment complex. There are codes in place for that. So if we if we find a, a dead raccoon in a um, in a uh, public pool, there might already be something in the code that addresses this. So you, I would be careful before using CDC recommendations because the codes trump CDC recommendations. Next slide. But CDC does tend to focus on pools open to the public and hot tubs as well as splash pads. And we do that through the Model Aquatic Health Code. This is a 450-page document, 200 pages of recommendations on designing, constructing, operating, and managing pools open to the public in a way that minimizes or reduces risk of illness and injury in and around the water. The last edition of the MAC came out in 2023, February of this year, and we're already working on the next edition, the fifth edition. So right now we have 
an open call for accepting change requests to the MAC through the Council of the Model Aquatic Health Code, which is a partner of ours that um, collates feedback on how CDC can best update the MAC. Um, in the winter, because um, I believe that this call for change request closes in October. In the winter, um, we will have a vote for the code conference where we'll discuss the change requests. And then the members of the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code or the CMAC are gonna vote on the change requests. And CDC is gonna take those change, uh, the voting results into consideration when updating or putting out the fifth edition of the MAC. And I, I get into the MAC here because I think there is a big animal issue that needs to be addressed in the MAC that is that involves public pools. Next slide, please. And that's the previous one. Um, that would be dog swims. Um, that's definitely something we've been hearing about for a while now. We haven't really addressed um, yet. But I, I do hope to be reaching out to my zoonotic partners, my One Health partners, in the coming months to, to start addressing those. If not in the MAC, then on the CDC website where all the other recommendations are. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, very interesting presentation and, and very timely given the rising temperatures and summer propensity for folks to use pools. We will move on to our final presentation for the day. This is One Health Response to a Blastomycosis Cluster in Wisconsin, and this will be given by Dr. Suzanne Gibbons-Bergener. Suzanne, please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to start with a brief overview of blastomycosis before diving into the One Health investigation of the cluster in St. Croix County, Wisconsin during early 2022. Next slide. Blastomyces is a dimorphic environmental fungus, which means the fungus is in the mycelial or mold form in the environment and can produce infectious spores but then morphs into the yeast form when in a human or animal body. As you can see on the map, Blastomyces is endemic in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys and in the Great Lakes region, as well as the eastern side of the United States. The mycelial form of Blastomyces prefers organically rich and slightly acidic soil that has high moisture or humidity. The optimal conditions would be an infrequently disturbed river, pond, or waterlands edge shaded by conifers from late spring through fall. Next slide. The inhalation of microscopic blastomyces spores from the environment is the most common transmission route to acquire blastomycosis. Direct inoculation by a penetrating wound is less common. The incubation period is usually between three to 15 weeks. So that's a very long time period. Next slide. Once inhaled, the spores transform into broad-based budding yeast and can colonize the lungs. Approximately 50% of infected people will remain asymptomatic or have mild self-resolving respiratory symptoms. The other 50% usually develop an acute flu-like illness with cough, fever, shortness of breath, and myalgia. The yeast can disseminate in the bloodstream to other parts of the body. This occurs in approximately 25 to 40% of symptomatic individuals. Skin lesions are the most common extrapulmonary manifestation. Progression to severe illness is uncommon but includes acute respiratory distress syndrome, meningitis, respiratory failure, and even death. Next slide. Along with smoking, having a pre-existing pulmonary or immunocompromising condition can increase your risk of more severe clinical illness. Delays in seeking medical evaluation when ill, especially for those individuals with known comorbidities, can also increase their risk of severe illness. Next slide. Activities that involve disrupting organically rich materials, especially in areas not routinely disturbed, may increase the aerosolization and transmission of blastomyces. Playing, walking, or fishing from a mucky water's edge, 
camping, hunting, or running through moist terrain in the woods, or being near an excavation or construction site are activities associated with increased risk of blastomycosis. Next slide. As part of routine blastomycosis surveillance, Wisconsin Public Health received positive blastomyces test results via electronic laboratory reporting, or ELR, for two residents of St. Croix County on January 26th and 28th of 2022. Both patients received medical care in Minnesota and interstate medical records sharing was initiated with our colleagues at the Minnesota Department of Health. Next slide. What really got our attention was a phone call on January 31st from my veterinarian in the Wisconsin, to the Wisconsin Department of Agricultural Trade and Consumer Protections Division of Animal Health. It's also referred to as DATCAP and to the Bureau of Communicable Diseases at the Department of Health Services, or DHS. The veterinarian had diagnosed four dogs with blastomycosis within the past two weeks. She determined that all four dogs lived in the same neighborhood. Even though in Wisconsin, blastomycosis is not a reportable disease in animals, she thought that this was very unusual and decided to report the cluster. This prompted surveillance record review by the State Health Department and the St. Croix County Public Health Department, and we were able to link the two recently reported human cases as living in the same neighborhood as the dogs. Next slide. The location of the cluster was in St. Croix County, which on the map is the red highlighted county, and it's in the northwestern region of Wisconsin across the St. Croix River from Minnesota. Next slide. On February 3rd, the animal and public health partners from St. Croix County, Wisconsin DHS, Wisconsin DATCAP, and the Mycotic Diseases Branch at CDC met to discuss the situation. Next slide. Based on what we knew from the initial case reports and about blastomycosis in general, the first public health actions that we took were to inform the healthcare providers, local veterinarians, and neighborhood residents about the unusual cluster. Because blastomycosis can have such a long incubation period, and because we were unsure as to whether exposure would be ongoing, we wanted to be sure that clinicians and residents of the area were aware of the cluster and knew to seek medical care for themselves or their pets if they were experiencing symptoms. Next slide. Wisconsin requested a CDC EPI aid to assist with the field investigation, which then began early in the um, beginning of March of 2022. Next slide. The objectives of the field investigation were one, to identify potential sources of blastomyces in the neighborhood, and two, to identify risk factors associated with positive antibody test results to better understand the current and past occurrence of blastomycosis in the area. Next slide. Briefly, our investigation methods included calling all residents of the neighborhood and interviewing those who agreed about human and pet illnesses and activities since September 1st, 2021, that might be related to blastomycosis. Assessing the topography and land use in the neighborhood and surrounding area. Enrolling household members and dogs in the Zero Survey Project. And testing blood for antibodies against blastomyces. Next slide. During our investigation, we were able to collect information from 58 of about 120 households in the neighborhood of interest. Next slide. Within the 58 households we interviewed, 147 people and collected health and exposure information for 65 pets, all of which happened to be dogs. Next slide. 140 blood samples were collected and tested for antibodies, 89 from people and 51 from dogs. Immunodiffusion and enzyme-linked immunoassay, or EIA, were used to test human sera. 
and a canine-specific EIA used to test dog sera. Next slide. The neighborhood was developed on previously idle or non-cultivated land that was a prairie with natural drainage paths to the river that runs adjacent to the neighborhood now. This neighborhood has a really nice trail system with paths extending from within the neighborhood on down to follow alongside of the river. The paths were generally grassy or packed dirt. Next slide. We arrived in the neighborhood and immediately noticed the river flowing through the neighborhood surrounded by dirt trails, which at the time happened to be under the snow. <laughs> These trails were frequently used and the members of the neighborhood participated in the maintenance and upkeep of the trails and nature area. These outdoor activities and the ongoing excavation and home construction can increase the risk of blastomyces exposure. Next slide. This is an example of the ever-present construction. You can see the piles of dirt. Um, this had been ongoing for the past few years in this neighborhood. Next slide. This investigation presented a unique opportunity to assess potential past exposure of residents and their dogs to blastomyces. IgG antibodies against blastomyces have traditionally been difficult to detect by the immunodiffusion assay, which has excellent diagnostic specificity, yet poor sensitivity. The results of our Ciro survey included the additional use of a newly approved EIA test that reportedly has excellent sensitivity and specificity. Of the 89 people tested, next slide, 50% of them had detectable antibodies. Next slide. Of the 44 people with antibodies, 25% or 11 of them reported at least one symptom compatible with blastomycosis. Next slide. Of the 51 dogs tested, Next slide. 15% or eight of them had detectable antibodies by the canine specific EIA. Next slide. Of the eight dogs with antibodies, 87% or seven of them had experienced at least one symptom consistent with blastomycosis. Next slide. Analysis of the presented data continues, and we are correlating case status and antibody response with risk factors captured on our survey, and are also looking at the special relationships between clinical cases, those with antibodies, and proximity to house construction. To date, the cluster includes five persons and six dogs that met the surveillance clinical case definitions. Some highlights of our initial investigation are that two ill residents sought medical evaluation at their healthcare provider, tested positive, and received treatment after we had informed the neighborhood of the cluster. We were able to give some initial prevention recommendations to the neighborhood, including considerations to take when walking along the trails and doing yard work. We had had a um, town hall meeting and were able to discuss this with the residents. And we also produced a new occupational fact sheet, which is published on our website. Next slide. In addition to resources on the Wisconsin's DHS blastomycosis webpage, we recently published an MMWR Notes from the Field article describing the outbreak and findings of our initial investigation. Results of the serology testing and in-depth surveys will hopefully be published soon. Next slide. I want to acknowledge the many people from various agencies, laboratories, and clinics that collaborated on this One Health investigation and the ongoing analyses and dissemination of information to increase awareness of blastomycosis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and what an excellent example of One Health in Action collaboration and investigation. So we really appreciate that. And thank you to all of today's speakers for their delightful, informative presentations. Next slide, please. Oh, no, wait, we're on the right side. Sorry. Um, links to resources. 
for each of the presentations that we've seen today are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash so who slash 2023 slash june dot html. We do have time for a few questions. Um, so if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature in Zoom, send them along, but please do remember to include the presenter's name or the topic so we know who to ask those questions to. So it looks like we have quite a few questions that are already there that we can get started with. Um, so maybe we'll begin with our first presenter, Megan. We've got a couple questions in the chat that all kind of have the same theme for you, Megan. So maybe I'll ask you a composite question. A lot of individuals were curious about what changes might have occurred during the project period that could have affected uh, the increases in cases that you detected. So among the questions, um, the potential things they were interested in understanding was changes in surveillance, reporting, provider education, the ability to diagnose, and disease awareness. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, this is definitely an important thing that we did think about when doing the analysis, and all of those definitely have a potential to impact the number of cases reported across states. Uh, so for for many states, reporting at the local level has been occurring since before 2011. So uh, as far as surveillance going, working for providers, that had been happening for many years before the national surveillance began in 2011. Uh, and there's also been no change in the national surveillance case definition since 2011 when it began. Um, but definitely numbers could have been affected by healthcare provider awareness and testing options available to them. Um, we're not sure about what a potential like uh, magnitude of an impact like that could be, but it is definitely possible. Um, but generally, tick-borne illnesses have been increasing across the country, and uh, this can be a really complicated. This can have really complicated reasons. Um, so, and it can be also unclear. Um, so, for example, the spread of Lyme disease over the past several decades has been linked to changes in land use patterns including reforestation in the Northeast and basically people coming into more contact with ticks and their host animals. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, and one other question for you is any idea what the underreported incidence rate may be? So we don't have an estimate for underreporting of incidents. Um, but the case definition itself does rely on having both symptoms as well as a diagnostic test. Uh, so a person would need to basically go see a medical care provider to get that test done. Uh, so if a person has milder symptoms, they might not be likely to go see a doctor to get that test or a provider may not order the test. They may just um, go ahead and begin treatment or something, or, or the person may not even need treatment. Uh, so it's possible that there are cases missing that would count as surveillance cases, but just that the person didn't receive a diagnostic test. Um, so we don't have a really good estimation for what underreporting could be, um, but it's definitely possible. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to our second presenter, Michelle. So there is a good few questions for you, Michelle, um, starting with a disease that you did not talk about, but there was an interesting question about armadillos in pools and the risk of leprosy. So you mentioned in your presentation a few parasites that were affected by chlorine and a few that were not. So this um, individual was wondering, is it appropriate to assume that adequate chlorine could prevent transmission in the case of armadillos and leprosy? So um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to go look up what the, the disinfection and, uh, and um, check in with my veterinary colleagues on this one. So, but I can, Laura, I can follow up with you. Perfect. Thank you, Michelle. A couple other ones for you. Um, any Bayless Garris infections linked to pool exposures? Um, and there's also a thanks in that for adding raccoons and pools to the main Bayless webpage. So um, in terms of pool exposure, we're not aware of any, but we do know that little kids um, 
put things in their mouths. That's why they tend to get Bayless Ascaris and they, we know that they drink a lot of water. So this is more so out of an abundance of caution and just the, uh, the um, parasites, the eggs resistance to chlorine. And yes, we work closely with our parasitic colleagues when we develop this content. So um, we, we cross link to their page, they cross link to our page. Perfect, thank you. Um, there was a question about animals just being able to climb over fencing around pools. So I'm um, wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about how that recommendation kind of came into existence. Yeah, um, so fencing, as we know from little kids, I mean, I, I, I'm more familiar with little kids. Uh, we do make sure um, that it that it fits to the ground as closely as possible. At least the requirements for fencing will be such as that. Um, in terms of climbing over, that that is a possibility too. I know for public pools, we re we require up to six feet. Whether they can fly over or climb over, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's more as a deterrent. It's not going to be the perfect uh, perfect item. But if you have any recommendations on how we can better at least keep the, the geese and ducks out, um, I, I'm happy to hear them. But um, we did consult with our colleagues at the uh, Fish and Wildlife Services what, um, on those recommendations. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and the deterrence angle certainly uh, seems to track. Um, one more question for you, Michelle, before we move on to Suzanne. Um, some exhibitors offer swim with the otter encounters. Are there any recommendations regarding water quality or disinfection for swimming pools that allow humans to swim with otters? So I guess this is going to be a different, uh, an, another example of where I'm going to have to use that One Health approach and go, go to my zoonotic colleagues and figure out what pathogens we're dealing with and then figure out um, how how to disinfect path those pathogens and how resistant they are or not of chlor to chlorine. So I will, Diana, I will follow up on that. And I guess I'm going to learn more about otters and armadillos in the coming days. That sounds like a fun few days then. Thank you, Michelle. I will move on to Suzanne now. So um, Suzanne, there was a question that starts with uh, a little bit of praise for you. So how interesting and valuable to explore fungal risk reduction. And we, of course, tend to agree. Um, could you talk more about how the residents received the information, how they felt about their risk and their ability to reduce it? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so. Um, just right from the very get-go when the cluster was identified, we we reached out with a letter to them and provided a fact sheet, two fact sheets. One was just a general blastomycosis and then one was um, blastomycosis in pets. Um, the problem is, is that we can't test an environment. Um, there's no approved testing or reliable testing of the environment. So that for most people is um, a little disconcerting because they can't um, sort of determine a value uh, on, on their risk. But as the, you know, we, we had to convince them of the value in participating in the investigation and that we were going to find, you know, um, different uh, exposures that could potentially have put them at, at risk. And, and so they, you know, most of the people really were, were very um, helpful and participated, and and so they they posed some very difficult questions when we had our virtual town hall meeting um, several months later, um, because we have to balance that sort of ideal with the practical recommendations. So yes, we could say you should wear a, a well fitting um, respirator and ninety five or better. Um, when outside, but that's really not going to fly um, if you're out um, <laughs> enjoying um, the neighborhood walks and and your yard and grilling and and so forth. So it was um, we talked about um, how to reduce the aerosolization uh, or the possibility of that um, of the spores with you know, how do we reduce um, disturbing dirt that hasn't been previously disturbed? Should we do it on a day when it's not windy and so forth? So they were more receptive when we were able to take a practical approach 
And that also led to um, our concerns for those people that were working in the neighborhood and allowed us to work with our Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Health to produce the um, Blastomycosis Employers and Workers um, fact sheet. And in the end, the most important thing, which may not be very satisfactory, is that they are very aware of it. They know what to look for. And if they develop consistent symptoms, they should um, seek medical evaluation for either themselves or their pets at the veterinarian and indicate that, hey, our neighborhood is known to have this um, in the environment. Um, the other thing that I always like to throw in is that for the most part with blastomycosis, um, people develop an immune response, a long lasting one at that. And so unless they become immunocompromised later on or have an overwhelming exposure, they're probably not going to have um, clinical illness again of blastomycosis, so. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And to all of our presenters again, um, so we have reached time. Um, as a reminder, there is no Zohu call for July. So please do join us for the next Zohu call, which will be on August 2nd. Thank you for your participation. And this ends today's webinar. Thank you. <laughs>